So uh, let's try uh, this problem. So let's go ahead and try working this out on paper. Take your time and try to use all the little notational tricks we talked about last time. This is a methyl group out here, and this is another D for deuterium, just an isotope of hydrogen. Okay. 
Okay, it looks like we picked that up pretty good. All right, so um, we, you identified the alpha and the beta carbons. That was good. One suggestion I would make is actually, you didn't have trouble with the Newman projections, but as a precaution, it's good to actually draw in the eye. And in this case, you, if the line of sight is really diagonal. So the safest thing is to draw the line of sight parallel to the alpha-beta bond. Remember, you're looking down the alpha-beta bond. Uh, this didn't mess you guys up anyway, but it's best to draw it so that the line of sight is parallel to the alpha-beta bond. All right, uh, and then it's a good idea to circle the beta hydrogen in the leading group so we don't lose track of those. So here's the beta hydrogen. Why is it so important to circle them? Because you don't want to confuse the beta hydrogen with, say, the alpha hydrogen, right? So you don't want to lose track. Here's the beta hydrogen, and here's the leading group. All right, now these are gauche. They're not anti, so we need to rotate until they are uh, anti. Um, now, it looks like, uh, I think one of you rotated both of these, so one was pointing up and one was pointing down. That's perfectly fine. It may be a little less work um, to just leave the hydrogen where it is over here and just rotate the iodide so it's anti. But either is fine, whatever you're comfortable with. Then you can probably actually draw the line that separates this in half between our two circles. We draw then our, uh, so let's see, I'll keep labeling the alpha and the beta carbons. So here's beta. And here's alpha. So, much easier to do that. so the beta carbon uh, has the uh, methyl group on it. All right, and we know we have retention of configuration. So since the methyl was cis to the hydrogen in this picture, it should also be cis to the hydrogen in this picture. And then on the uh, alpha carbon, um, let's see. So uh, the alpha carbon. I think I messed up, didn't I? Let's try it again. So the methyl group is on the beta carbon, and then the hydrogen is cis, but it's on the alpha carbon. You get confused here. Okay, that's right. Easy for me, anyway. So then the ethyl group here is on the beta carbon. I just have to keep saying who is where. And then the deuterium is cis to the ethyl, but it's on the alpha carbon. By the way, this is a good notational trick that makes things easier to write. Notice that we don't have to keep writing out CH2 to CH3. It really saves a lot of space to just say ET for ethyl. It would be perfectly fine to have that in your final product uh, as well. You would get full credit for this. The TAs know what this means. Uh, and by the same token, it's a little less work to write ME for methyl. By the way, you should be familiar with this because you can see this on the text. ME stands for methyl and ET stands for ethyl. But it's not, it's not just that you want to be able to write them and then if you see it, you can actually use that to simplify your own drawings. Uh, Simple, simpler drawing is better. So if both of you guys have the same picture here, pretty much. Okay, good. Uh, so I would uh, end up with this. I'll go ahead and uh, draw in the mechanism here. It's always good to draw the mechanism. All right, one more point I wanted to make is uh, remember that um, one way to rationalize why we need the anti planar transition state is to minimize the steric hindrance between the leaving group and the hydrogen. Now, that's a, a pretty good definition, roughly speaking, uh, explanation. By the way, um, this is not optional. E2 doesn't work unless you can rotate to an anti-periplanar transition state. E2 requires an anti-periplanar transition state. E2 requires an anti-periplanar transition state. E2 requires an anti-periplanar transition state. Um, now, normally that's no problem because normally we can just rotate to get that anti-periplanar transition state. I think we might have seen in the past, I don't remember, maybe we haven't. There are some molecules that have limited flexibility though. Molecules say that have rings. A ring gives you limited flexibility, so a ring might not be able to get an anti-periplanar transition state, and then it might not be able to have an E2 reaction. So that would be an advanced application of this, but that might be on the test. That's probably not the best use of our time right now, but you should have in your notes. Uh, a ring might not be able to rotate to an anti-periplanar transition state, and if it can't, um, then uh, it can't do an E2 reaction. We have to you look at some kind of like chart or something that maybe would be provided on the test, like to show that like it wouldn't be able to be rotated, or we just have to kind of. You should be able to look at it and see. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, I just wanted to sketch that out for you, but uh, we actually don't have too much more time left today, so maybe we should go on to our next topic. That's a little bit uh, that that actually could be tested, but uh, we want to get the basics down first. So um, so we've gone. So what have we gone over so far? We've learned um, the stereochemistry of an E two reaction. 